Hey, Patricia. Hey, how are you? I'm doing fine. It feels like it's been ages since we've been together podcasting, whether it comes out every other week or not. I think it's been over a month. Yeah, I know. So I'm excited about getting together and going at this again. Yeah, so I went away to France, which I haven't been to Europe in over 20 years, and it was really an off the cuff thing. And so I couldn't podcast with you for a while, but I was going to tell it's you a, a little excuse. a little bit about it cuz yeah. I had you in my mind when I was there. Ooh. I had some of the things okay. you've taught me in my mind. Okay. Well, so first of all, I went on this trip and it was kind of a risk cuz I was leaving a lot of things that I was that I needed to handle. I just you know, I just went for it. And a college friend called me up out of the blue. And this college friend is a, she was in my wedding. We're really close. She's a writer, like a short story writer, published short story writer. And she said, Hey, Patricia, do you want to go to a writing workshop with me? It's in the Loire Valley of France. We live in a, like a family run castle. And it just sounded wow lovely. Yeah. And I said, okay, great. But I'm more of a podcaster and the things I write are, it's like, curriculum for groups and there's some memoir element to it but I, I have never written any fiction she said oh don't worry about it don't worry about it you'll be fine you'll fit in whatever <laughs> so we show up and the entire schedule revolves around writing we are required every morning to write at least 500 words that then we have to present to the group for critique and evaluation every afternoon Okay, I don't sit down and write 500 words unless I'm really inspired and it happens not all the time. Like I'm not a regular writer and all of these people are PhDs, MFAs, they have agents, they're publishing, all of that. I have never had worse imposter syndrome. <laughs> oh my gosh. So anyway, I, <laughs> I had you in my head like, okay, you know, have fun, be lighthearted, go for it. Um, you know, like carpe diem, the way you jumped out of an airplane, like I just went for it. So I just went for it. And I realized I could hang with the group. Like it took me a couple of days. It could, yeah. took me a couple of days. But one of the things that I also learned on this trip ties into the topic of this podcast really well, which is, can I just say what we're yeah. going to talk about? Go for it. Okay. So we're going to talk about if you have a goal of something you want to accomplish in your life, do you focus on the outcome or do you focus on the process or both? I mean, you're going to illuminate this. Yeah. But every single person at this writing workshop would, came in with either a novel, a screenplay, short fiction, short stories, poetry. They were trying to get it published. Okay. But what I learned from them is wanting to get something published and having all these ideas meant nothing. It was all about commitment to a process. And I learned mm. that, that like I was not that different from these people. I just didn't write every day. Like my skill level was not really that different from some of them. It's just the only difference was that what I woke up in the morning and did for two hours was different from what they did. And for that two weeks, I wrote every morning for two to three hours. And by the end of the time, I felt really proud of what I was doing because I had committed to two weeks of the same process that a professional writer does. And it was really fun. And I learned that like process versus outcome. That's the, that is actually such a perfect introduction kind of to what we want to talk about. And it is, it's like so on point yeah. to so many things that, um, that somehow I want to take this, topic that I've been mulling on, um, kind of doing a little bit of a deep dive. And I want to make it so tangible and real for us to talk about and for people to listen to. Because I think in some ways, it's, it's a whole paradigm shift mm -hmm. that if we can make in our minds this paradigm shift in the right way, it can begin to reframe everything within our lives it can begin to reframe problem solving it can begin to reframe our relationships it can reframe our personal growth it can reframe our spiritual life it can reframe some audacious goal like what you're talking about in writing 
And if we can begin to see with those eyes, an old podcast, Mm -hmm. uh, then everything becomes a little bit different. So somehow my hope, and, and it's such a great introduction to this, for those listening is that you'll stick with us in this uh, because it may uh, be a spark for thinking about something that you're a little bit stuck on Mm -hmm. or some hump that you can't seem to get over or something that you want and you don't know where to begin. This may be a, a, a new way of thinking about it. And it's not original with me, but I'm just going to frame it for us. Yeah. And I think I, you know, if we think about the last couple of years of us podcasting, you have done a lot of things and we've talked about a lot of things like you have overcome a problem. We talked about weight. We talked about your diet Coke addiction. So for some people, you might be thinking, okay, what I want to work on is a problem that I want to overcome. But Another thing that you might talk about today is something you want to accomplish. It's not a problem yes. you want to overcome. Like maybe it, I know you love golf. So you might talk about your golf game, your, you know, whatever. Right. I, I don't really understand golf that much, but whatever, whatever yeah. you want to accomplish. Or for these writers, it was writing a book. But whatever it is, whether it's a problem that you're trying to overcome or a audacious goal or dream that you have, it's good to identify where you are in this like this mountain you want to climb? Is it that you haven't started yet? Is it that you're halfway up the mountain, but you keep running into the same like obstacle that you can't overcome? And every time you get to this point, you just have to abandon the course or you can't, you can't get over it. Yes. Or maybe it's your, you've done so much and you just don't have the energy to finish it. Right. So like, we're not going to go into those three areas in detail, but I think for everyone listening, if you think about What's a problem you're trying to overcome or what's a dream that you have? And in this process, is your hang up in starting? Is your hang up in some obstacle you're reaching along the way that you keep running into? Or is it in finishing well? And in this podcast, Tommy's going to give us a bunch of, we're going to unpack this idea of process versus outcome thinking. And we're going to hear some systems and ways of thinking about it to help you wherever you are in those three stages. And Part of what you'll hear that will try to make this tangible, we use a lot of analogies, things right. that that I've worked on or tried, you know, in terms of process. Uh, don't get hung up on this specific analogy. Consider them analogies. Right. So, oh, okay, he did this. That's kind of similar to what I'm facing. So they're all analogies that are not meant to limit, but actually to expand the way we think about this and the breadth of influence and impact that this can have. Well, and one of the things I love about podcasts and one of the things I loved about this writing workshop where I was is that it debunked this this little thought that we get when we're trying to overcome a problem or when we're trying to achieve a goal. And that is when we run into an issue, whether it's starting whether it's the obstacle we meet or whether it's finishing well, we start to think if it's not going well, there's something wrong with us. Right. And it's this little thought like, oh, I'm not meant to do this or I'll never be able to do this or I'm not good enough to do this. But what I learned on this writing workshop and what I love podcasts that they do is that you get inside the head of other people who are trying to do this adaptive change in their life and you realize that the things you're running into the questions you have about yourself the self-doubt the dis you know the all the little thoughts that pop up everyone else is having the same thing too and together when we air those thoughts out they become less debilitating and sometimes it's just what we need to get over that hump so so like i just want people to know that by talking about this process versus outcome thinking you'll realize that all those things that you are running into, those issues you are running into are common amongst everyone. Absolutely. And, and hopefully it will take a lot of our, our, I can't, I could never, uh, this will never happen. Right. And it'll turn them into possibilities and a, and a, a tangible way of being realistic rather than just, optimistic 
about something that you want. Mm -hmm. So um, in a sense, we're talking in a big kind of mental way, but this is one of the most practical uh, discussions hopefully we'll have. Okay, good. All right, well, let's get started. So process versus outcome thinking, where do you want to start us? So uh, I'm going to kind of start by putting out there the punchline okay. for this, uh, kind of where the statement that, that I want to make about it, and then we're going to uh, drop back to some specific analogies, some practical uh, um, times where this has come into play and then some barriers and things. So when, when I'm thinking about process versus outcome, here's kind of what I wrote down that what this involves is having clear desired outcomes and then create a great process to get you there. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes when I've heard people talk about process versus outcome, Another way that it's been verbalized is journey versus destination. Mm -hmm. You have these various kind of phrases. When I hear people talk about it, they pit one against the other. Like, oh, you have to be all about the journey. Doesn't matter what the destination is. Mm -hmm. Or you have to be all about the process. Doesn't matter what the outcome is. Or just focus on the outcome. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and what I want to say is that these two work together synergistically and that we need clear, precise, defined, correct outcomes, north stars that we're pointing to, but we can't stop there. Once we have that, and that's so important, we need to then do the work of defining the processes, the regular routine practices that we will do that will get us there. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a bit what we're going to talk about in great practicality. Yeah. And as you're talking, I'm thinking about how, if it's a problem that I'm trying to overcome, like say it's weight or habits, it might not come naturally. And the process is going to involve a little bit of keeping ourselves in check. You know, it's sort of like reining our natural inclinations in. If what we're going for is a goal, a dream that we're going for, it also might involve some discipline. But those deciding what your outcome should be, deciding what dream you should produce, you should pursue, should come somewhat naturally to you because it, you're you're delving into something that you're naturally wired to do. You're trying to capitalize and maximize on who you are as a human being inherently. So I think it's important to distinguish kind of the, the, what goes into these outcomes, deciding whether it's something you need to like restrain or whether it's something that you're trying to refine that you're going for. Right. And in our discussion before we started about this, I thought you had a, a really good point that uh, part of that work of figuring out what it is that we want is we have to do a, a little bit of a deep internal dive because mm -hmm. sometimes we get in stuck places in our life because we have clearly identified what the world tells us we should want mm -hmm. or what our parents tell us we should want or what everybody else says you should want. And that then becomes our outcome because we go, well, you know, if, if everybody else is doing this, I should be doing this. And we don't do the work to say, what really matters to me? Mm -hmm. What do I really care about? Whether it makes me a lot of money, whether it makes me famous, whether it makes other people happy, whether they, they, they shun me mm -hmm. as a result of this, what really is important to me? That's a different level of Thinking. And I, I love that you brought that out when we were talking about that earlier, because I don't want to minimize this sense of having clear desired outcomes, because that's very important work. And I, and I think back, and, and I don't want to harp on this whole weight thing, because, uh, you know, it's just an example for me. 
But for so many years, I was very stuck on this weight thing because I was uh, conflicted in my own mind as to why I wanted this. Hmm. Uh, I was conflicted because deep down, I really knew that a big part of wanting to lose weight was just my vanity. Just to look good. I wanted to look good. But you, you do look good. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks. Look good. thanks. I appreciate that. Did you, have you had to buy all new clothes? Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Uh, I think yeah. I saw you after you'd lost a bunch of weight and your shirts were way too big. I remember this. <laughs> I was like, yes. dang, Tommy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but I, was I was really conflicted because there was this vanity and I knew in my mind, I went, well, that's a really shallow reason for wanting to lose weight but it was there and then went but it should be about something more and it all became reframed in my mind in that deep dive and in a goal setting one year when i realized actually from reading the bible where it said your body is the temple of the holy spirit mm. and i thought that's what this needs to be about mm. i need to take care of the temple Hmm. I need to clean up the temple. And all of a sudden I realized I'm always going to have some mixed motives about me. So I, I acknowledge that. I confess that and everything else. But this is important because my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and I need to clean up this temple. And it freed me up to say, this is important for me. This is important for me to do this. Okay, so the what is the goal, and in that example, your what was losing weight, but your why for your goal needed to change. So at yes. first, your why was, I'd like to look thinner. Yes. But for you, that wasn't enough of a motivator to overcome the obstacles that came with the process of getting to your goal. Yes. When you got a stronger why that worked for you, then you were able to commit to the process and including all of its obstacles along the way. Yes, and, and actually the what changed. Okay. The, the what originally was, I wanna lose a certain amount of weight. The what actually became, I want to become healthy and disciplined. Hmm. I realized that what was really important and what would stick for the long run was becoming a healthy person to the degree that I was not at the weight and lack of exercise and that I had allowed myself to become very, very undisciplined mm -hmm. in all of these areas of body, eating, nutrition, exercise. And so my what actually changed to say, this is about becoming healthy and disciplined. And then knowing that in reality, if I did that, the other things would take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. So the the different why actually reframed the what. I gotcha. Which then reframed the process. Gotcha. All right. Well, that's interesting. So we're we're talking about the what, which is the goal, and the how, which is the process. Yeah. But before you start all that, you got to do some deep work, reflective work on why you have the goal in the first place and, you know, why yeah. you want it. So or, that could or be what the problem is or what the stuck place is. And right. why is why am I stuck here? Yeah. Right. OK. All right. So that's good. So you get your goal. And then where do we go from there? So once we have our clear goal, mm -hmm. then we begin to think of what is the process the process or processes that we need to uh, put into our life that if practiced regularly will move us clearly in the direction of our goal. Mm -hmm. So um, in my case, for instance, with the weight, it was, okay, one portion. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change that one thing. There were two or three things like that. It was also um, no desserts except on very special occasions. Um, so it was, it was a couple things. I said, all I need to do is I know that if I do those couple things with regularity over time, 
then I'm going to be moving significantly in the direction of my clear desired outcome mm -hmm. that I want. Don't know actually what that end place will be. And what was interesting for me on, on, the, on the weight front, at least, was that in my mind, I had identified um, just because of all of my past struggles with this that I wanted to lose, you know, roughly 15 pounds, maybe 18 pounds. I, I didn't have that when I entered this process. I'm just going to do the process for a year and see what happens with it. I blew past the goal. If I had had simply the outcome, as what mm -hmm. it was all about, as soon as I hit the number that was in my mind, I would have fallen back, which I've done so many times. But the process huh. actually took me so much further than what I thought I could do. Wait, now, so that's fascinating. So your outcome in the past when you failed and it didn't work, well, I don't like to use the word failed. I think you learned. Let's say that you learned. Oh, okay, that's good. Um, part of the reason it didn't work is because you honed in on a smart goal. <laughs> no offense, but yeah. you honed in. I mean, smart goals. It's like yes. give it a number, give it a, a you know all that. You honed in on a smart goal, and the problem with smart goals is that you put all your energy into getting to that goal and then you have no energy left and then you throw in the towel and you backslide, right? Absolutely. So yeah. instead of having a smart goal, you had more of a, 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 val a goal that was tied to your why. Like you just wanted to be healthier as a vessel for God and your best humanity, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't have a, a, a weight number attached to it. Yeah. Um, and then you thought about the process that would get you there. And it, it, your original statement is both the process and the outcome are important. Both the journey and the destination are important. And by having a little bit of a less smart, but more like value driven outcome goal, your process became less like of an enslavement. It became a little bit more of a sustainable pattern, would you say? Hugely so. Yeah. And there was, I'm a little anti smart goals. I have to. I have to well, I, actually, if you think about it, and they have, they have their place. I they guess. do have their place, but they can be evaluated. Smart goals, and in, in to a large degree, are the epitome of outcome based thinking. Right. And what I'm suggesting is something beyond that. So, in my mind, I knew when I started this um, that six months down the road nine months down the road, I might have lost 10 pounds, you know, just by mm -hmm. doing this. It might be five, might be 15. I wasn't really sure where this would take me. I wasn't sure how much of a difference it would make. Uh, but in, in the end, and we'll talk about this later when we kind of put some steps according to this, six months down the line, I should be able to ask the question, am I healthier and am I more disciplined? Because that was the real what. Hmm. Now, if I'd said yes and I'd lost no weight, I would maybe need to check myself mm -hmm. a little bit on that. But I realized that that wasn't a precise type of thing. I just didn't know what would happen with this, which is so true of so many things. You know, one of the problems with an outcome focused orientation is that we don't control life. Mm. We think that if we just do this and this and this, that A, B plus C always equals D. Mm -hmm. But life happens. So many things get in the way and processes or things that we might do. Um, sometimes have different results than what we think. We run into storms, we run into problems. And so there's a freedom by being tied into a process that frees us up. And it freed me up, in essence, to go far beyond what I thought I could do. Hmm. And I think that's a possibility, for instance, 
in all sorts of things. So you talk about uh, writing. Mm -hmm. You entertain a process. And let's say you were to, for the next year, continue what you just did. I'm going to write 500 words. I don't know where it's going to take me. Mm -hmm. And you might have this vague sense in your mind that I want to write a book. Mm -hmm. You do 500 words. You may find that that process exercised every day and continuing beyond a year, you might end up being an author of 15 books. Mm -hmm. Something that you couldn't imagine at this point in time, but that the process over time can take us to places that we can't imagine. Let me use a, another example. Mm -hmm. Everyone I know struggles at some level with relationships that yeah. they would like to be better. In our minds, we have almost a protective mechanism that would cause us to be a realistic about what a relationship could be, mm -hmm. you know, with a, with a spouse or with a child. And so we go, well, you know, gosh, I'm going to dream of this relationship reaching this level of maturity or this level of intimacy. And so we entertain a process. It may be that that relationship could go to places that we have never considered mm -hmm. if we would just uh, practice a process of certain things that would initiate new patterns and new possibilities within that relationship where people can go from contempt to intimacy mm -hmm. in a relationship that seems utterly impossible, mm -hmm. but with processes regularly practiced can become possibilities. Yeah. And even naming these things, like I want to have a better marriage or I want to be a better parent, have a better relationship with this child, or I want to have some very close friends. Naming that outcome is so empowering. And then oh. thinking, okay, why don't I have that? And, and, and like being open to feedback, like why do I struggle? What is hard for me about, what is hard for my child about me or my adult child? What is, what is, do they find difficult about me? And having the fearlessness to face that, or even asking your spouse, like it, what is the one thing that is most difficult about being in a relationship with me? Like talk about brave to ask that. Yeah. Or friendships, like maybe taking a fearless look at yourself. Do I have a problem listening? Do I have a problem asking questions? Do I, am I too serious? Am I too, um, you know, whatever. Am I unwilling to initiate? Yeah. Do oh. I talk too long? Do oh. I, do I not initiate? Do I not put myself out there? Like, and then you realize what the obstacle is. And when you name it, sometimes it stops being so big in your mind because it's not, but by the way, remember what I said in the beginning, all of our obstacles are common to other, other yes. people. That's what I learned on the writing retreat. Like the, the thoughts I have in my head of, oh, that sentence is terrible or, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. Everyone has it. So all of the things that you find out that are obstacles, other people are dealing with too. And it's not that big when you name it and when you face it. Right. And so the, the process of figuring out the process mm -hmm. is once you identify what it is that you're dreaming of, the outcome that is worth the effort to you, then you, with that clarity, that naming of it, uh -huh. you can begin to think, well, what are one or two or three small steps that if practiced regularly will compound and move me significantly towards that. Perfect example, write 500 words. In a relationship, let's just do a date night every week. Yeah, or go for a walk after dinner. Yeah. If not every night, right. one night a week, and twice a week. In the end, maybe your process isn't perfect. And we'll come back to that. There's nothing wrong with tweaking the process. Yeah. We don't have to become married to the process. But when we have the clarity of what it is that we're really wanting to do or where we're stuck and what we're wanting to get over, then 
I think most people would be surprised how easy it is to identify one or two or three things that we could do regularly. Um, small wins mm -hmm. that we could initiate that will make a big difference with time. The problem so often with people is they want a quick one big win mm -hmm. to it. One miracle pill that we take that's going to fix everything. And that's not process. Mm -mm. So with each one of these things, once we have that clarity and we say, okay, what are the one or two or three things simple that I need to do? And what we'll often find out is one or two of those are very, very easy to do. Mm -hmm. They're not hard at all once we identify them and just go, well, oh, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can do that every day. You know, um, that's not a big deal. You know, and so it now becomes very manageable and doable. All right, let's stop there because you say that, all right, so we, um, we look at what we want, what our goal is, and then we find one or two or three steps that create a process that we're going to commit to that gets us to our goal. Mm -hmm. And you say that some, sometimes those steps are so easy. I have the opposite experience where I find sometimes those steps are so big and I need to take one step and break it into three. Right. So mm -hmm. for an example, um, I, say I need to do some work online on my website because I haven't touched it in six months. I hate computer work. I hate all of that. It's so overwhelming to me, that task, that I put it off, put it off, put it off because it's intimidating to me because it's outside of my realm of expertise, all of that. So sometimes I need to, I find that when a step is overwhelming, if we break it down even more. Another example would be I'm in, I'm in seminary and sometimes having a 20 page paper to write is so overwhelming. So I'll say, okay, I just need to open a document, title it and write one paragraph. Because for me, remember we talked about the, the process, sometimes it's starting, sometimes it's halfway through, sometimes it's finishing. Like for me, I don't have a hard time in the middle. I have a hard time in the beginning to get started. It's like, I need a jump start. So right. for me, my first step needs to be really small and really doable. And other people might be different. Other people might need to break down their final step, you know, to finish well. But I just find that when you reach an obstacle that is too big, sometimes you need to make it really, really manageable. And I'll give you an example, an illustration for this. So I've been doing this boot camp for years, 20 years in Richmond. I love it, love it. And we, when we first started, Years ago, we had this huge hill over at Dogwood Dell. And every time we went to work out there, we knew that we were going to have to run down and up that hill three times in a row. And it was brutal. And I remember when we first started, I was like, this is going to kill me. I mean, this is a steep, long hill. And every time our coach would say, take small steps, short, small, short steps, when you run up a hill, don't look way up the hill, just small, short steps and find a pace that you can maintain. And that phrase, find a pace that you can maintain and small, short steps, I think can apply to so many areas. Because if you are say going on a diet or trying to write a book or trying to start a business or trying to do whatever, and your pace that you start with is too intense, you won't be able to maintain it and then you'll yes. have to get off. Mm -hmm. And so what you've said is like pick one or two. I think that's a really important thing when you pick your one or two is have it be a pace yes. that isn't crushing you when you start. Absolutely. It's one or two small things that if practiced regularly will accomplish big things. And then to round out that story, mm -hmm. he would always say 90% of success or whatever the expression is, is just showing up. Right. So we would do that run probably once or twice a week. And after six months, I have this distinct memory 
of running up to the top of that hill after my third time and feeling like I could do it three more times. I was crushing. Now, this is like 15 years great? ago. Yeah. But I, when I think back in my life about one of the times where I felt most alive and most strong, I remember coming to the top of that hill. And all I did was find a pace that I could maintain. I didn't try and run too fast when we first started training. I just would pick the, sh the slowest pace that I needed to do to be able to accomplish the task. And it was really, really slow, but I showed up for six months. And by the end of six months, I could practically sprint those three hills. And it was just about consistently showing up. And the beauty of that, I mean, it's, that is so cool and so powerful. The beauty of that is once you got to the top of that hill, you became almost there was probably this sense of invincibility on oh i remember Man, if i can do that i could do anything yeah i was like my body has never felt so good and so strong and i remembered six months before i could barely walk up it i mean a lot of people in our group that's what they did do is they walked up and he said it doesn't matter you show up you can find you find a pace you can maintain and you take small short steps and i, I th that like stuck in my mind as like a proverb for life right yeah there. So I'll, um, I'll add a couple of little funny, similar examples. Uh, there's a good book by B.J. Fogg, I believe is his name, called Tiny Habits. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a great book on habits, but he talked about wanting to develop a habit of doing push-ups. Yeah. And so if I'm remembering it correctly, his habit was every time he went to the bathroom, he had to drop and do two push-ups. And that's all he needed to do. Yeah. And by starting tiny, because he could do two push-ups, it was like, well, I can do that. You know, all I have to do is just every time I go to the bathroom, I'll do two push-ups. And then eventually, after he did that for a long time, it was like, well, this is silly. Why don't I do three or yeah. four or five? And all of a sudden, before he knew it, he had this great push-up habit. And <laughs> You know, a, a, a guy that I work out with, I've been working out with him, 20 years, he's 65 years old. And he said, I want to be able to do 30 pull-ups because he used to be able to do 30 pull-ups. He was very strong and he couldn't anymore. So he said, every day I'm going to do five sets of five pull-ups, which was the most he could do. And he just showed up and he did that every day. And he said, when it got easy, I bumped it to six. This was three months ago. He's already doing 20. That's exactly that point of, you know, it, we sit, we sit, if we get fixated on an outcome, we're selling ourselves short. I mean, he was like, I had no idea that I could get, and, it, and he picked a number that was not overwhelming to him, that he didn't dread, you know, like I was talking to him because I used to be able to do pulps too. And I said, what number do you think I should start at? And he said, how many can you do right now? And I can do six or seven right now. That's great. He said, start with two. So it's so easy. Just start with two, five sets of two, five sets of two. Just make it so easy. Then add three. And I loved how he said, like, start with something that's almost fun for you to do. And it build, like, build the habit, build the build routine, the confidence. build right. the process. It's yes. like you're building the process right. with things that you can already do. Yes. So again, at this point, I want to remind everybody that's listening is these are nothing but analogies. Right, 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 right. These are <laughs> examples of things that, if you apply them to that issue that you have that really matters to you that you really want to accomplish have parallels right to it the the importance is finding your parallels to this uh sure and they happen and when you begin as you said so greatly with the analogy of the hill when you begin and you see that all I need to do is to develop a manageable small process and repeat it, and I can do about anything. It begins to change your whole frame of mind about everything around you. And it infuses a realistic optimism about problems that you can uh, that you run into, humps, barriers, challenges all of these things begin to look differently because you've experienced a process of, of accomplishing things. And I've seen that to be so true 
in my life, which is what gets me so excited about this. All right, I'm going to push back on you on something else because you are like a life coach. You're, I mean, you're a life coach in your blood, yeah. right? Yeah. Like you life coach yourself. Yeah. The rest of us normal people aren't like that. Like I, I can think of an idea, I can set a process, but halfway through life takes over. I just, I'm not as committed because yes. I'm not as committed as you are. So my question for you is how important is it to involve other people in your process? Like either body doubling, accountability, imposed deadlines, like some sort of outside or like maybe you have a nutrition coach right. or a trainer or a class you go to, yes. like some kind of outside influence. So it's not just in, in sure. between your two ears, sure. in your head. Well, I, I would say two things. First of all, uh, when we undertake what we're talking about, it's critical, particularly in the early stages, that the things that you work on matter deeply to you. Right. It has to be significant enough that you really deeply want it mm -hmm. so that there is a deep level of commitment. You can't do this, particularly on the front end, across 10 different areas and things that don't really matter to you because you're not committed enough and nothing will change. So assuming that it is something uh, that you are committed to and you, and you do the work of the process, having some people, having a coach, having some friends, having some accountability, I think is often one of the most effective, important things that you can do. Many of us, uh, including myself, are not strong enough to do it just on our own. Mm -hmm. You know, our willpower will lag. Our resolve, even on important things, will grow dim. Um, some of the small things will feel hard at a certain point and will fall by the wayside. So I think a really important and valuable piece of the process is getting that accountability. Mm -hmm. So for instance, and you, you know this, uh, part of the process uh, that was not really kind of my initial thoughts of, of everything that I've been doing in the health realm is um, a text that, that I put out every Saturday now for almost three years with your husband and another good friend just saying where we are in this journey. Okay. It, I know about this text and it's been awesome because you, like I said, you have this ability to stay the course. So, so Tommy, my husband, Steve, and this other guy, they send a text every Friday about how they did on their health goals. And I have been known now to take, have to take pictures of my husband, like with his shirt <laughs> off to show before and after. And I'm like, oh my gosh, here I am taking another picture oh, of so him funny. and he's flexing, right? Yeah. He's flexing. So, um, you know, but that makes me think of another thing. I'm sorry. I'm like Mrs. Tangent today because you've got this clean outline and I keep thinking of these other <laughs> thoughts, but I keep thinking about when you have a goal and you're not accomplishing it on your own, very well, or you keep running into issues, maybe you're running out of energy. The idea of bringing someone else in is a little bit like, it, it, it's like a catalyst to making it happen, okay? It, it's accountability, but it's yes. not just accountability. Like, I thought about this with my writing group, like all of these writing writers at this workshop, none of them have, are independently wealthy. None of them, you know, can just, buy their way into this. Like I know that nowadays when you're creating things, one of the ways to be a catalyst for growth is to just buy things. Like you can buy followers on Instagram, you can hire marketers, you can, and there's no harm in doing that. Like if you have the resources, go for it. Like you can hire trainers to lose weight. You can hire nutritionists and definitely adding money to a problem, throwing money at a problem can like jumpstart you, sure. but not everybody has money. Not everyone can do this. And one of the things I picked up on with this group, and I think it, a lot of creators are in this ball game where they don't make enough money, they don't have enough money, but body doubling or being in groups or cohorts in a weird way has the same impact as throwing money at a problem. For example, like if you can't hire a trainer, can't hire a nutritionist, 
but you get a group of people who have a common goal and you do it together. Like say you have a running group. And so, I mean, that's just a, just something to throw out there. If you feel stuck and you look around and all these people are hiring people to help them with their problems and you can't do that, the same impact happens when we get a collective group together to do something. It's absolutely true. And in this very simple text that I send out, yeah. you know, every week is a perfect example of that. Absolutely no cost associated. And we've been doing this now for almost three years. And there have been plenty of weeks that each one of us have had to text and say, I didn't do well this week. Yeah, you know, I ate a lot more than I wanted to, or I didn't get any exercise, or there have been plenty of less than stellar texts that have come out. But the inspiration and the help of saying, here's the truth of the matter, but I know I'm going to be sending this text next week, and I don't want to send another text like that. And so even just the process helps because I don't want to do that two mm -hmm. weeks in a row. And I'm going to keep on doing this until the three of us decide not to do it, which means I'm going to stay on this track because I'm not going to be the one to be embarrassed and say, you know, I've, I've just gone hot. Yeah. Things. yeah. And so it is helpful. And so that text has now, years later after kind of the process started, has become part of the new process. I mean, all three of you guys have done so well. Like I, I do wish we had sort of before and after pictures of all three of you guys, but I've known all three of you and you really, it's made a huge difference in your life over this many years. Yes. And, and one other, like a non-health re related goal, um, I came back from this writing workshop and I have a friend who's a comedy writer who lives out in California and she's not a professional comedy writer. She just does it as a hobby, kind of like I, you know, I am exploring hobby writing that's not for work. That's just for pleasure. Right. Um, it's not for like a group curriculum. And I said, you know, I want to keep this part of me going, but it's not my job. It's not my work. So I can't keep the pace that I had in France of two or three hours of writing every morning. But I don't want to just let it go. So she and I came up with this plan where every week we have to send each other a text that says, I told her I want to write 500 words a week, which is tiny, tiny. She said she wanted to write a certain number of hours a week. Tiny, not much. She has another job. And we both decided that if we don't do it, we have to Venmo the other person $5. Like it's it. so I small, it. yeah. but it's something. It has like a little something of embarrassment. Yeah. Like, oh, I got to Venmo you $5 if wow. I didn't do it. And that alone, we just started. So maybe three years from now, we'll be like you guys and we'll have something to show for it. Yeah. But that just gives you an example of the power of body doubling, the power of community. Um, and, and if you don't have that community, you can hire it. You can hire that accountability. Oh, yeah. But it mm -hmm. doesn't have to be that way. Exactly. And so I, I'll, I'll segue this into uh, really defining process a little bit more because we're, we're, we're talking this language. So in essence, a process is a plan. Right. That's where it starts. You have a plan. You take the time once you have that clear outcome and you develop a game plan. Right for how I'm going to do this. And that game plan has to be well thought enough, well thought out enough to incorporate, is it the right pacing? Mm -hmm. Like you said, does it have an accountability element? Is it doable in the, in the sense of everything going on? So you develop this game plan. And so, maybe by the way, you might need to get some input on the game plan. Like oh, you might need absolutely. to have a trusted friend or someone who's good at an area you're weak at to get some help with your plan. Always a huge benefit. Right. So, so the process begins with a plan. Right. The second piece of the process is systems. Okay. Regular things that will help you. So for instance, theoretically with your friend, one of you is taking on the responsibility of sending the, the text and saying, you know, we're doing this. I've taken on the responsibility uh, with the Steve and Chris. Of, I'll send the text mm -hmm. each week. And do you have an alert on your phone? Like, how do you remember? Yes. So, so you have a I system. have an alert that comes up on my to-do list every Saturday morning that says, send text 
Yeah, uh, and you see. check your to do. You have some app, I, like a, yes. whatever your list app is. That is part of my whole life routine. Thing is I, I I have a to do thing, and I follow that determines my life. You know? Yeah. So even that step, though, which you take for granted, right? Like I'm thinking of some of our younger listeners who have never had to develop like the daily planner, or the lists, right. whatever. The like that may be a part of the process is figuring out how to have your daily to do's or like your one or two things that you have to accomplish in a day and how to be able to set reminders. Sure. Yeah. So of which you might a, need help with, which is a system, right? Right. So, exactly. so once you get the systems, the whole point of systems, and I can put this in the show notes because we did a whole podcast on systems. The point of it is, is it makes success automatic. Right. And then there's like the habit stacking, which is a part of, so what's something you're already doing? You right. layer in a new habit, like, maybe brushing your teeth, you have a post-it, yeah. no, that's not a great and, example. But. Well, and the beauty of, of the systems is that it, it often makes habits easy to incorporate. We right. talk about how difficult, difficult it is to develop habits, and it is if we're taking them as one-offs, but if they're part of habit stacking or if they're part of systems, they become very easy, like developing the, the habit of you know texting you know related to this is not hard because i have a reminder that comes up and i just right. do it you right know? so i have a system that makes the habit easy so the process is simply plan systems and habits all right process plan systems and habits yes and if something's not working what do we do we like we don't throw it all out what do we yes. do so once you have the process, so once you have your clear desired outcome, right? It matters to you deeply, you know, whether it's a problem or something you want to accomplish, or whatever. Okay, so you, the visual for that is like the top of the hill. The yes, absolutely. So you've got your goal, which is the top of the hill we're running up. Okay? Exactly. And then you say, okay, here's the pace that I need to do, here's the clothes I need to wear. Here's the process. Right. All of the things involved, you know, looking at all of the places that could sabotage you along the way. Right. Here's the process that once I decide on this, all I need to do is execute the process. Right. All right. So that's big step number two. So maybe I'm running up the hill and I realize I can't make it to the top. I've learned my pace was too much. Right. So I don't throw the whole thing out. It's just the next time I run the hill, I go slower. Yeah. Maybe you start to run up the hill and you get halfway up and you go, man, I don't have any water and I need water. Right. Because next time I'm going to have water. So you look, you try to pre-think through all these things, but you may not be able to pre-think through everything. Right. And all this is analogous, by the yes. way. It's all analogous. Exactly. So, all right. So then the, the third step, and this is true with so many things that I talk about in terms of. Uh, weekly reviews and so many things is you have to consistently reevaluate okay. how it's going. So the process is not the end. Yeah. The process serves the purpose of the outcome that matters to you. Mm -hmm. So the process can be changed. It can be tweaked. If it's not the right process, we need to face up to that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we've done the work so that the process is pretty sound. But very regularly, we need to step, preferably on a weekly basis, and look and say, how is the process going? That process might, we may not be executing it well, but we're still completely convinced of the process. Mm -hmm. We may be saying, man, I've been going at this process now for two months, and it's not moving me to the outcome. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to reevaluate the process. If you do the front end well, you probably won't need to do that. So then by reevaluating it on that regular basis, hopefully a weekly basis, mm -hmm. uh, by reevaluating it, it, it creates a, a type of recommitment mm -hmm. to it because you go, yes, yeah, I'm, I can still do this. Yes. I'm beginning to see these small little inklings of process of, of progress that I want. Yes, I'm completely committed to this. Mm -hmm. And so you reevaluate on a regular basis of 
how is this process going and it, is it moving me in the direction mm -hmm. that I want to go? And then we might be utterly surprised that it's taking us far beyond the outcome that we imagined. Well, and I like the example you shared about your weight because I really get stuck on, is my goal the best goal for me? Like my goal may be based on something that I'm naturally good at and other people want from me, but it may not be something that I'm drawn to, or it like you really wanted to look good. And that wasn't a bad goal, but it wasn't the fullest goal. It would be like that right. hill. Like if my goal was just to run up that hill three times, that's one thing, but it was so much greater w when I discovered I love the feeling of feeling strong and alive uh, and invigorated. Yes, and so yes. it was, it wasn't about like reaching a certain speed or time. It was about just feeling like so alive and so strong and so fully myself. And I just wonder if at some point in this process, if it's not going well, if we bring our goal into some sort of contemplative place, um, whether it's praying or meditating or reevaluating, because sometimes, I mean, I think all of us want to have this sense of flourishing, of feeling alive. And maybe our goal is too small. Maybe it's too limited. Maybe it's too narrow. And it needs to be enlivened or expanded. And that's why I love that you were given that kind of reframing of the goal that really helped you get it. It, it, and it, it, it like um, animated or enlivened the journey for you. Yeah, and a, another way of saying this is that that uh, contemplation, that reevaluating, the spending time, is stepping back and making sure the ladder's up against the right wall. Yeah, and I realized early on, through a lot of failures, that if I went about this the same way I had in the past, that I might have some limited success, but it wouldn't last because the ladder was up against the wrong wall. And so that reframing to say, this is about being a healthy, disciplined person. Mm -hmm. And that now all of a sudden, the ladder was up against the right wall and it was worth climbing, climbing being the process. Same thing for you with the hill that you were running up. It was just about getting to the top and you do that and you forget it and it's all over. No big deal. But when it's about being stronger, mm -hmm. when it's about overcoming, now it's something utterly different. And that, that is the even bigger picture of all of this because you pat me on the back in a sense saying I'm a life coach and this stuff, but this is the, power of compounding of doing things and finding which was not always my character at all doing things and finding that there is more possibility than i imagined mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden you do one thing and you have the success and you go wow if i could do that then why couldn't i do this mm -hmm. and then you do that and you go well why couldn't i do this mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the world opens up. It turns from black and white to color mm -hmm. in terms of what's possible. And that's, that's really the big picture in all of this. But it begins, in a sense, this small process towards a particular outcome is almost like that small pacing mm -hmm. that you're talking about. It's, it's one little tiny thing in all of life when we look at it in the big picture that once we learn that, we go, oh, that could work here. Yeah. That could work here. And all sorts of things become possible. And this is so much for that person that feels defeated, mm -hmm. that feels stuck, that is down because life isn't working. That it's a small, not easy, but it's a small process mm -hmm. to turning the Titanic of things not going well around. I love that. And, it, you know, I just, 
it, unless you have some closing thoughts, I was thinking of a way we could sum this up. And well, I, I think once you've identified what the hill is you want to run up, okay, whether it's a problem you want to overcome, whether it's a goal you want to accomplish, a big audacious dream, it's it, the word find comes to mind. So you find a process or a plan, you find a pace you can maintain. You find the obstacles, you know, you're fearless about your obstacles facing those. Um, so that may be talking to a friend about or, or like identifying some of your barriers and friendships in your marriage as a parent, like that takes some fearlessness yes. in being willing to do that. Or what are your obstacles in, as, if, as a creative person trying to produce something, or maybe it's your golf game or weight, weight loss in your career and the encouragement. Mm -hmm. In that is what I learned on that writing retreat is just know that whatever your obstacle is, whatever you're feeling, everyone has felt that before. You're not alone. Yeah. So that thought of give up, you're not meant for this, or you're not good enough, just shut that out. Like nobody's got time for that anymore. <laughs> yeah. So find a plan, find a pace, find the problems. And I'm going to add, find your people. Yes. Find your people, mm -hmm. find a pace. Find a plan, find your problems, and find your people. So that's my portable about how to get up the hill. Anything you want to add to that? That's great. Uh, I, I love this discussion. Again, we would love any comments that you have. Um, I said recently, feel free. I welcome for you to email me, Tommy at TommyThompson.org, because I would love your feedback on whether this is helpful to you. Uh, what issues you have with what's said. Uh, we want to grow this and we want this to be helpful for people. We certainly hope that you will uh, share these thoughts if they're uh, helpful to you. Yeah. Um, but this just excites me. And it's this has been a, a really fun conversation. And I'm at patriciaclark.org if you want to reach me. I'm not a life coach, but more uh, can, can come in if you want a female. So. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you've been, enjoyed this.